Good boy. Hello world, my name is Matt Spa, and I'm a photographer, videographer, and cat hair covered fairly handy fellow in Atlanta, Georgia. In this video, I'm going to show you how I solved what for me was the biggest problem with the Zoom F6 audio field recorder. My channel is about all things audio, video, and photo related. Comments, likes, and subscriptions are hugely helpful in broadening the reach of my channel and helping keep me jacked on my digital dopamine high. So if you're inclined, please hook me up. If you've seen my other videos that mention the Zoom F6, you already know what a gushing, giggly schoolgirl I turn into when I talk about this little magic box. But as I mentioned in my recent rig updates video, I had problems incorporating it into my video rig. If you put any amount of weight on the top of the unit, things get unstable. So in this video, I'm going to build a cage that will not only cradle my precious F6, but also be stout enough to support my eight and a half pound camera rig. I made a number of prototypes to sort out my design, and the current one is pretty simple. It's two aluminum plates with a quick release mounted to the top, and cutouts that allow me to tighten the quick release and give me battery access. On this version, I totally cheaped out on the quick release system. I bought this one, made by however you say that word, because it was 13 bucks and it had a big bottom. <laughs> it had a wide base plate, but it's wider than it needs to be, and you can only slide the plate in one direction, which means that if I remove the cage from my rig, the camera can't connect to the fluid head. And The moral of the story is make sure whatever quick release system you use will work with whatever tripod system you're using. I ended up with this unit from Nicey Rig. It's not exactly cheap at 30 bucks, but it's well made. It will allow the plate to enter and exit from either side. And it's just tall enough that I don't have to make that clearance cutout in the top plate of the cage to be able to tighten down my camera, which not only saves me some cuts and cleanup time, but will result in a stiffer upper plate. This version uses eighth inch thick plates and quarter inch diameter tubes, but for the final, I'm gonna go to 3 16 inch thick plates to give it a heftier look. I'll put links below to my sources for all the materials, and for what it's worth, the eighth inch material is fine structurally. I just think it looks a little thin. The tubes, like I said, have a quarter inch outer diameter, and the inner diameter on this particular tubing is just the right size to cut some screw threads. Into those threads, I'll drive eight countersunk screws, which will keep everything nice and flush on the top and bottom. The top plate, of course, will get the quick release, but there's no quick release on the bottom. The bottom plate will screw directly into my 15 millimeter rail mount system. Now that does mean that when I remove the recorder from the rig, I'm also removing my 15 millimeter mount and rails. Time will tell if this ends up working well or not. Lastly, you'll need the hardware to put it all together, which is eight screws for the two tubes, some quarter 20s for the F6 and the release plate, and for me, four screws to mount it all to my rail system. I'll put a materials list in the description below, and I'll also include a link to a measured drawing if anyone is interested in all the specifics. For this project, you're going to need some basic tools, a way to mark and measure your cuts, something to cut metal, and something to smooth the cut marks on your edges. You'll need some drill bits, including a countersink and a 1024 tap, and cutting oil for threading the tubes. You'll find this much easier if you use a drill press, and some kind of stationary sander will be hugely helpful, but you could do it with a handheld drill, and I'll show you my method for cleaning up saw marks by hand using a simple fixture on the bench. It's called a bench hook, and it allows you to hold material and make cuts or clean up edges safely and securely. Mine is a half inch piece of plywood with two cleats that are glued and tacked into place. The lower cleat goes up against the edge of your bench, and the upper cleat supports the material. The cleats are 90 degrees to the platform edge, which means 
you can use that edge as a guide to square and clean up your edges after you make your cuts. Now we can begin. Step number one is don't do dumb things. If you're not confident in your skills or don't know how to use these tools, either get help from someone who is and does or pass on this project. The standard disclaimer here is that this information is presented for entertainment purposes only. So I'll do my best to be entertaining at the very least. Step number two is to make the plates. You need two plates that are four inches wide and five and an eighth inches long. The bar stock that I'm using is already four inches wide, so I just have to mark it at five and an eighth and make my cuts as accurately as possible. Aluminum is pretty easy to file or sand smooth, but cleaning up the saw marks can still be a lot of work. If you're using the bench hook to make your cut, push the material against the fence on your hook. Forward pressure keeps everything securely held in place while you make your cut. With the cuts done, I need to clean up the saw marks and make sure that everything is square. To do this accurately, I use a block that is square on two sides and some adhesive-backed sandpaper. I stick the sandpaper on a block and use a small spacer against the bench hook to keep the edge of the block from sanding into the platform. With the spacer in place, I can slide the block at 90 degrees to the fence. With my cut aluminum in place and against the fence, you can see how the block sands the edge smooth and square. I hope that makes sense. The process can be slow, but it's very accurate. Alternatively, you could square and smooth your edges on a stationary sander, but the sander wants to grab the material. It can get hot, there's dust and noise, and the aluminum edges coming off the sander can be really sharp. Just remember rule number one and don't do dumb things. With the edges all cleaned up, I'm going to tape the two plates together and I'm gonna add some witness marks. This will ensure that the holes I drill at each corner line up and will help me to keep them oriented correctly. On the lower plate, I need to drill a hole to attach the F6 and four smaller holes to secure the plate to my rail mount. The top plate needs a pair of holes to mount my quick release. I'm keeping these centered and my goal is to make the top plate symmetrical because that makes me happy. For the battery access area, I'll mark the cuts, drill a pair of holes at the corners, cut the rest of the material away with a jigsaw and file the edges smooth and square. The last thing I need to do on the plates is drill countersinks in all the holes and ease the edges with some sandpaper. With the plates done, I can move to step three, which is cutting and threading the tubes. To clear the top of the F6, the tubes need to be just under two and three quarter inches long. When you cut these, be careful not to deform the tube in any way. If the tube is not round, cutting your threads will be a pain. Before I use my sanding block to clean up the ends on these, I wanna cut the threads. The threading process is pretty straightforward. You oil the tap, screw it into the hole, and it cuts the aluminum, but it sounds a lot easier than it is. The tricky part is holding on to the tubing while cutting the threads. The thing to keep in mind is that the tap needs to run straight into the tubing. If you mess it up, it's usually easy to figure out why. You either got out of alignment or maybe you went too fast and got the tap stuck. If the tube gets hot, you're going too fast. You'll learn more in two minutes of trying and failing than I can impart in a half an hour of rambling. Just know going into it that it's a slow process and set your mind accordingly before you begin. With the tubes threaded, I'll tape all four of them together, making sure my tape is an even thickness all the way around. And I'll use the sanding block technique to get them exactly the same length and to get them square on the ends. This step is really crucial. It's important that the tubes all sit square to the plates, making even contact all the way around. If they don't, the cage will be loose, which defeats the whole purpose of having one. With all the parts done, I did a test fit of the cage, and once I knew everything fit together properly, I went back to the stationary sander and I rounded over the corners of the plates to match the radius of the countersinks. I also smoothed the edges around the battery access cutout, and I did some hand sanding to ease all the edges. 
At that point, I realized I was limiting my options with the original layout of my mounting holes. I designed this cage for a very specific purpose, which was to fit between the rails and the camera for situations where I was working alone or with a small crew and my talent needed a teleprompter. My caddy buddy teleprompter will mount to a rail system, but the camera needs to be at a certain height to line up with the highlighted text on the prompter screen. And that was the goal of my original design. But one of the benefits, of course, to having a cage is being able to move things around. So I started thinking about ways to make it more flexible by adding additional mounting points. First, I added two holes that allow me to mount my camera cage directly to the top plate. Then I drilled a single hole so I could mount an uncaged camera. For situations where I need to use a uh, follow focus or other rail mount accessories, I duplicated the four smaller holes on the lower plate so that I can put the rail mount system above the recorder if I need to. On the bottom plate, I've drilled two holes and tapped them with quarter 20 threads so I can attach my quick release plate that mounts onto my tripod directly to the lower plate when my rail mount is on top of the cage. I definitely have more more options now. Granted, reconfiguring everything will take time and a Phillips head screwdriver, but I usually have a pretty good idea of what I'm going to be needing or doing at any given shoot, so I can at least get the basic configuration put together before I'm on set. As Norm Abram used to say, now it's time for some assembly. For the original design, the teleprompter setup, the first thing I need to do is attach the tubes to the lower plate. With those in place, I can attach the lower plate to the rail mounts. Viewers of a certain age might remember the new Yankee workshop featuring the craftsmanship of Norm Abram. I loved that show. Each week, Norm would come on and build some fantastic piece of furniture and he'd walk you through every single step and he did work at a really, really high level. He made things so clear that I felt like I could do it too, and that was really awesome. It was always bittersweet though when he would come around to the now it's time for some assembly part. All the parts were about to come together, but it also meant that the show was almost over and you were gonna have to wait an entire week before it was on again. Norm, if uh, you ever see this, I am forever in your debt. You changed my life, pal. Anyway, back to the project at hand. With the lower plate in place, I need to attach the recorder to the bottom plate using a quarter 20 screw. This is gonna be a little bit tricky because I'm actually using the recorder to record the audio for this episode. So I'm gonna be very careful not to hit the off button while I do this. Single quarter 20 screw is all you need to attach this to the base plate. And that's part of the problem with using this recorder is that because there's only one attachment plate, it means that you just, you can't put any weight on the top of it. With this plate in place, I can now install the quick release plate to the bottom rail mount, which will allow me to mount the cage onto my tripod. The last thing that I'm gonna need to do is, uh, well, after I pick up the screw that I just dropped, hang on. The last thing that I'm gonna need to do is unscrew this to put in the screw that I just dropped. Hang on. Okay. If I hadn't already tried to record this like 40 times, I would just stop and start over again. But we're just, we're all gonna have to learn to live with it at this point. <laughs> this really has been probably the hardest video I've ever made because there's just too many moving pieces. But I digress. Lastly, I can put on the top plate to which I have already attached the Nicey Rig quick release receiver that accepts its mate, which is already on the bottom of my camera cage. This combination I have found, because I've actually used it a little bit now, is perfect for small shoots where the teleprompter and the rig need to be used. The rig is really solid and my recorder is well protected. I have easy access on this design to all the inputs and outputs on my recorder and changing batteries or SD cards in both the camera and on the recorder is really simple. With the additional mounting holes that I've added, I can reposition the rails for using my follow focus and still be able to make quick changes on the tripod head. 
I'm sure it will continue to evolve, and if I come up with any significant improvements, I'll definitely do a follow-up video. I hope that this video has been helpful and, of course, entertaining to anyone who's made it this far. If you liked it, please hit that thumbs up button. If you like this kind of content, please consider subscribing. And until the next one, thank you so much for watching. Thank you.